Good evening once again and welcome to our live Doctor on Call program. This evening, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a very special program for you tonight. And um, of course, Dr. Francis Martin is with us, no stranger to the program. And in just a moment, we'll start our discussion. So we welcome each and every one of you, our viewers on GBN Television, 7 and 11, our listeners on K105 FM, and of course, our friends on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. It is indeed a pleasure to have you. Tonight, we're talking public health. Of course, it's... Uh, uh, globally, Public Health Awareness Week, and by extension, the month. And uh, so it is important to remind us all of the importance of public health. Of course, um, for those of us who probably still not too clear on what public health is, um, we will get to understand it a little better this evening. All right, so it's a good time to welcome Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin, good evening. Um, I trust you had a great Easter weekend, and it's a real pleasure to have you back with us on the program. Yes, Godfrey, as usual, I am always pleased to be part of your educational program. And the Easter weekend was one that I used to uh, do a piece of my passion, which is construction. So I, I built myself a plant box and a soy box. <laughs> so I could do some little planting around the house. I, 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 for a moment there, I, I, I thought you were telling me you constructed a kite, you know, for flying. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that has to be a really big kite to construct. I mean, we, when you make a kite, you get a certain size in mind. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, I think you just you just gave me an idea for, uh, for our We Culture program, you know. And, and it's amazing how words, um, you know, although it might mean the same thing normally, but right. um, depending on the context, it's a completely different thing. And, and, and you're right. You are Absolutely. so right. <laughs> Construct has to do with some massive thing, but you yeah. make you make a kite. <laughs> I like it. I love it. I love it. So this evening, Doc, we're talking um, public health. Um, very, very, very important. In fact. Um, you know, I may say if we have a good public health system, um, it may save us a whole lot um, from having to, um, you know, visit visit you so often and, of course, our medical facilities. So um, let's start um, by, you know, just putting this whole thing into context. Public health. What do we mean by that? All right. Well, the term public health refers to a science and an art. Mm -hmm. A science and an art of preventing diseases. Um, it has to do with prolonging life and prolonging a good quality of life. It has at, as its foundation health promotion for prevention of disease. Um, but all of these preventative things and, and the science and art is provided through a number of areas in the society. I usually call it all of society approach, but it really just means through organized efforts of um, societies, organizations, public uh, um, health, private practitioners, and at the core of it is communities and individuals. At the core of public health is how to protect communities and individuals. Notice here, we did say we said nothing here about treatment right. of any disease at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. has to do with the organized efforts, with the sole reason for health promotion, prolongation of life, and disease prevention. So, health promotion, for all intents and purposes, is a contrast opposite to disease management. Mm -hmm. Disease management is a completely different thing. Disease management is learning how to control your diabetes, learning how to control your blood, your hypertension, your cholesterol, learning how to stop and prevent heart disease and, and um, heart failure. That's disease management. That's what is done in a hospital. Mm -hmm. A hospital does disease management. Mm -hmm. It's a secondary healthcare system. 
clinical medicine. The healthcare system is the one that should really focus on public health. Right. I I I want to create a scenario for you um, that that probably might um, you know help to to further explain it. So um, I am I am I I jump into my car and I start driving down the road and I get into an accident. So let's put two things in the context here. The whole public health issue and the, the, the clinical aspect of things, the clinical aspect of it. Um, where does public health coming in that accident as compared to the, the medical side of things or the clinical side of things? The public health side of it starts with you as the individual being knowledgeable and educated about where you're going on the route that you want to take to get there. Mm -hmm. The public health approach requires that the car be a good and safe car and that the brakes is working and the engines are working. The public health further goes on to say that when you get onto the street, there's appropriate signs for you. The road is clear enough, well lit, and this wide, broad, broad enough to make you have a safe driving experience. That safe, that goes for the next person driving the other car as well, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that there are no puddles in the hole, that there are no stray dogs running out in the road, that kind of thing. Um, and it, the other aspect of public health is that you are supposed to learn how to drive properly understand knowledge of the highway code and speed limits and that kind of signage and those kind of things if all of those public health approaches and aspects were ignored then you get into an accident that's when disease management takes over the ambulance come to get you and the doctor tries to fix the problem mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I I, I I am smiling here, um, listening to you, and um, I actually, and I'll be honest here, I actually, I, I did some reading up today, and I actually came across that example, I decided I'm going to throw it on Dr. Martin, and let's see how he, um, and, and Dr. Martin, I mean, I, I called the children, your copy? Because, I mean, <laughs> You know, <laughs> because um, it, it, it's so much on the ball. And, you know, when I when I went through it and I, I read through it, I'm like, but this is so important. And, and you mentioned an area there um, ensuring that the roads, um, as it really support holes and so. And, and, and this is where, for example, um, you know, government comes into in, 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 in play. And, and not only, you would notice, not only, let's say, for example, the Ministry of Health, but we're talking here the Ministry of Works. Um, you know, who has a responsibility to ensure that the roads are the best. So um, I, I, I'd l I really love the example of, of, of that um, to show how public health, you know, actually comes into play. And that, that takes me to the other area. So, so uh, th there are three core service areas of public health that has been referred to. Um, protection, promotion, prevention. Um, we could look at them individually into some detail so that our listeners can, you know, continue to grasp the concept. And we could probably start with protection. Right. Protection kind of have to also be um, knowing what your vulnerable situations are. So for example, people living in the tropics are exposed to infectious diseases. And we have multiple examples of um, if infectious diseases that really um, affects people in the tropical regions. So um, vector control, these vector, vector bone diseases like dengue, chikungunya, H1N1, and those type of things, um, malaria, um so other types of respiratory infections and then there are viral infections that can lead to um very specific neurological disabilities um and and we're exposed to this H hdlv1 is a common example in the eastern in the east africa um southeast asia and the caribbean so knowing what your vulnerabilities are gives you the reason to 
embark on a protection mechanism. Um, yellow fever, for example, you know, devastated a lot of Grenadians who were build, building the, the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. So in this example, protection here means um, vaccines and immunizations to protect you from measles, mumps, rubella, German measles, and um, protect you from other things like tetanus and, 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 and dengue. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a dengue um, vaccine as yet. Mm -hmm. So protection here is vaccination. Um, protection here also means reducing the the, the the amount of vectors to decrease the chances of vector-borne disease. Mm -hmm. So protection here means keeping mosquitoes down. And keeping mosquitoes down means that individuals and communities have to do what they have to do personally to keep um, this, this thing down. So the, the protection can come on different levels. And, and the, the primordial protection which is protection that the government should actually uh, put upon you, refers to laws and regulations that the government puts to ensure that you do not um, put the, the public at risk. And, uh, and that's a form of protection. A, a great example is the laws regarding vaccination for children to enter school. Mm -hmm. Um, another form of protection is laws regarding um, infectious diseases, and in particular, TB. Because in Grenada right now, there is a law that makes it illegal for you not to get treatment for t tuberculosis. And in many countries, you can actually be arrested and the medication is forced into you for tuberculosis. So that's an example of what protection is all about. Um, there are other forms of protection. And uh, again, as I said, it's, 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 it's legal. For example, um, outlawing smoking in public places. Um, that's another form of protection. Um, in other words, you protect people against the risk factors for diseases. And those are just a couple of examples of what protection means. Right. I, I want to take it a little further to, to ask you, what about, for example, um, managing environmental hazards and, um, you know, ensuring that the, the workplace is, is healthy and, and, and also management of health emergencies? Absolutely. Um, in fact, there are laws that empowers the Environmental Health Department to um, to prosecute uh, people who violate those type of protection laws and protection issues. The only problem is is that these laws are so outdated that it costs more to take the person to to court than the actual punishment uh, that, that that will be um, given. Mm -hmm. And so these laws need to be fixed. But these laws exist for environmental hazards. Um, um, for that to happen. Um, the, the, the OSHA laws, which has to do with workplace um, health, and, health and safety in the workplace, is another issue that is, is protection. I am not sure how far um, we as a country have gone in terms of the legal aspects of uh, workplace safety, but I know this has been something that the, the unions have been very um, mm -hmm. um, very vocal about and have in a lot of instances do the best they can. They've even used my service from time to time to help again with this educating the workplaces as mm -hmm. to what are the best um, activities and protection they should have in the workplace. Okay, lovely. Um, let's let's move to the promotional aspects of things. But no, just before we get there, um, on the issue, for example, of managing environmental hazards and, and sort of backtracking on... Um, uh, the, the, who is responsible then for public health? And and you mentioned a number of them. And and, and one of our local organizations here, for example, NADMA. Um, so they too play a key role. And and maybe people, if you didn't realize it, so you now we're now trying to make the connection. So so organizations like NADMA, and so they do play a key role in the whole issue of public health. The promotional aspect of it, which, which deals with um, improving um, population health. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, well, the promotion of the health is, is no is now filtering down closer to the individuals and the communities. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it requires action on their part. Um, at the upper level, at the primordial level, government um, and, and, and health institutions are responsible for setting guidelines and policies and, and in place to protect people's health. But when it comes to actually promoting the health, the individuals have to get involved. And, and they get involved, first of all, through education and knowledge mm -hmm. of, of what happens in the environment. They themselves need to be educated about their own bodies and they need to be educated about the risks that, uh, that they face in their individual community. 
And by no, no, knowing that, that gives you the opportunity to promote um, your healthy living and so on. Let me give a, a, a simple example. Um, we as black people are very prone to insulin resistance and we can develop lots of diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the health promotion aspect of it, you want to educate us and tell us, we, we have to educate ourselves to know that we are at risk because we have a predisposition to becoming diabetic. Um, and we also have a, a gene in us called the SALT gene that increases our chances of hypertension because of our genetic variability from our African origin. So we need to know this. And if you know this, you will now learn that you need to eat certain foods in order to prevent diabetes and promote good health. And in so doing, you would learn that the foods under the ground are the better ones for diabetes because it, it's complex carbohydrates. It does not increase your blood sugar very much. You'd also learn an interesting fact that fig and blogger do not interfere with your blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. Right? So you change your diet because you want to promote that aspect of your health. And lastly, because we all now learn that 60% of us Caribbean people do have this salt gene variation, that we now have to learn that salt is a major, major stimulant for hypertension. So you will learn that if you eat a portion of ham during Christmas, <laughs> you'd have used five times the amount of salt your body could use for the day simply by using that. So mm. those are the type of education that gives people the health promotion aspects of things. And we need to talk about it more in public so that you know people would understand. Definitely. Um, so, so definitely we're talking here about promoting healthy behaviors. What about improving um, the social determinants of health? Improving the social determinants of health is really a deep sense of, you know, what has to happen because, um, and, and the truth of the matter is a lot of people ignore the social determinants of health because let's just face it, Godfrey, it is much easier for a health system to set up a dialysis machine mm -hmm. and simply dialyze people with kidney failure mm -hmm. than for them to go into the social aspect as to why the person developed diabetes and try to prevent diabetes. And so a lot of countries and organizations and authorities take the easy way out by refusing to deal with the social determinants mm -hmm. of health. HIV is another big example. There is definitely social determinants of HIV. It has to do with gender-based violence. It has to do with um, 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 discrimination. It has to do with alcohol consumption. It has to do with the overall sexual behavior of people. And, and the bigger story here is sexually transmitted diseases. But over the years, the Global Fund and the World Bank has spent billions and billions of dollars not dealing with the social determinants of HIV. They simply spend the money to train people how to treat HIV patients to put money into research for HIV drugs, but no one dealt with the social determinants of health. And so now we're still facing that problem. Mm -hmm. So who's responsible um, in dealing with, with the social determinants? I mean, I, I want us to zero in on it because I, I, I am, I'm, I'm thinking here that as individuals, we do have some responsibility as well. Well, to tackle the social developments of health, it takes the authorities to do that. Okay takes the authorities to do that. Um, and of course, the authorities must be the springboard, the springboard for dealing with the social determinants of health. But the, 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 the users or those persons who are affected at the end of the line, they also have a responsibility, first of all, to accept that they need help and to follow up the, what they need to do to take care of their health. This is one of the examples that I gave in the past where I say that a Ministry of Health has no responsibility for actually running a health institution. That's not what a health, a Ministry of Health is there to do. A Ministry of Health is there to set guidelines, follow up, do vulnerability um, um, checks, and to um, evaluate um, what is happening and set guidelines for what is happening. And those are where the social determinants of health are dealt with. It must be from an authority standpoint. Um, you know, Doc, I think we, uh, just to backtrack a bit, um, we went straight into um, 
improving the social determinants, but I, I don't think we explained what it was. Um, so let's just backtrack a bit. So when we speak of the social determinants of health, what are we talking about here? We t we're talking about things that happens in people's social lives that leads to a disease, mm -hmm. all right? Things that happen in people's social lives that leads into a disease. So one example is poverty. A poor person has a less ability to be able to eat well and eat properly because of what's going on. Educational level has another thing to do with it. If the persons are not educated enough, um, that social problem can be an issue and they may not be able to be knowledgeable enough to manage their, their care. Gender-based violence is a social determinant of health, all right? Um, accidents, um, alcohol consumption, because alcohol consumption decreases your, 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 your chance of making proper decisions. Um, um, sex and gender, sex is a big issue because um, a, a, a female is more likely to drop out of school and have her education affected than a male because, of course, as we know, that, that kind of social issue. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about that. Um, um, the, 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 how, how you keep you around, you, 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 where do you live, for example? Do you live in an area that is a mangrove or do you live in an area that has poor drainage and there's a lot of mosquitoes because of where you live. So those are the kinds of things, your environmental condition, the circumstances in which you live, um, your ability to have safe and good food. Those are the social things that impact your health at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, and and very importantly, um, polluted air and water. And I know um, the whole issue of water more and more is coming into play um, with, with climate change and all of that. It is of concern. Um, and, and I just wanted to spend a little time on, on, on clean air, um, you know, that we breathe. And a lot of times um, we, we tend to burn a lot. We burn things a lot. Um, uh, these are things that, that, that we need to pay attention to. Um, for example, um, what in, you, and you mentioned where we live. So, for example, people who, who let's say, rear animals like pigs and so, and, and have the, the, the pig styes in residential areas, um, this can't be healthy for, for um, the environment in which we live. That's correct. Um, air quality is a big deal and, and air quality is determined by a lot of times it's determined by a geographical location and the activities that are taking place in the area where you are. We in the Eastern Caribbean um, get affected by the Sahara dust very often. Sorry. <laughs> and many times the particles of the Sahara dust are respirable. That means they're less than 25 micrograms and you can actually inhale those into your lungs. And this can lead to hypersensitivity of your lungs because of poor air quality from the Sahara dust. Um, for uh, for coops or for run, for example, um, they do create, um, there are also respirable particles that comes from being around them in that area. Um, pig sty is another example. It, and of course, it depends a lot on where you, when you clean the, the, the area where the pig is, 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 is um, bred, what where does the water go mm -hmm. um because if it goes down into our um, water table it can actually get into the rivers and the persons who are living downstream of that river can be affected by it so you're right those are another examples clean water safe air um of things that are considered um social determinants of health okay wonderful um so we we spoke of the of the the core service areas of of um, of, of public health, and uh, of course um, having these core areas is one thing, but in order for it to make sense, um, these areas um, for them to function, they you know they must they must be able to they must be enabled, and um, we want to look at some of the the areas um, uh, how they can be enabled. For example, um, good governance at the top of that how where does that come into play we mentioned earlier um, uh, in, in in the area of, of promotion 
and 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 some of the 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 social determinants government has a key role to play there let's go a little deeper into that in in terms of good governance as it relates to public health and and um core service areas good governance is going to good government governance at the end of the day um is going to be a very vital aspect of it you know i like to think of it as a kind of systems thinking we understand that all of them is important um but none can happen in its entirety by itself all three must function together mm -hmm. if, if one aspect doesn't function the system is going to be suffered because of it and so that system thinking is is, is kind of like an all or nothing approach you either do it or you don't because if you do one the others would be able to survive on their own so governance is at, the, is at the, is the center of all of this and it depends on your system um the vulnerabilities that you have the the risk factors that, that your communities face um your current health status of your country that would help you to determine what type of governance structure um, should be done um, it also determines what kind of a health system you should actually have for your country as well um, in the in our part of the world as, as a matter of fact in the commonwealth we have actually inherited a kind of a health governance system from the english um, and that happens in the commonwealth now we are seeing that it is really not the best governing health systems for what we have evolved to become. And so it is important for us to rethink what kind of governance system that we want to have. And I again want to reiterate that the best systems works where the actual activities or actions for public health takes place at the community levels. And the governance systems or the health authorities, their responsibility is overlook, to view from above, set guidelines, policies, and make sure that they're implemented, monitor and evaluate them for improvement. And I think that, again, is the best governance system that would ensure that you have a good, vibrant public health response. Right, indeed. What about and of course, um, uh, and I guess in every health, every every health sector, or every every country, every government, they do have health goals. Um, you know, we often hear it: a uh, uh, nation's wealth is its health. So you do have health goals. But um, in terms of advocacy to influence and obtain support and commitment for for the actions that support the health goals. Um, uh, where would you place advocacy? For small islands like ours, uh, public health will never be achieved if there is no advocacy. Mm -hmm. And again, you have to, again, know where your risk factors are and do the advocacy right where your risk factors are. Uh, an example is uh, when I just started my public health um, practice somewhere around 2012, I think I joined the ministry at that time. Um, I was put in to be responsible for the HIV program on the island. And immediately I saw what the situation of HIV was, and I was able to identify where the risk for infections lay. And once I identified the vulnerable groups that were at risk of increasing our HIV numbers, I immediately reached out to them. I didn't wait for them to reach out to me. I reached out to them and had an advocacy there. Long story short, we had a very successful program and our HIV numbers started to drop on a yearly basis since then. Excellent. So um, this advocacy is, is really important. And there are some major institutions on the island that the authorities need to utilize with this advocacy issue. Um, sports and young people is a huge part. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ready supply of a lot of young people in that area. So um, advocating among a football situations, cricket, athletics, um, let there be some public health response there. Um, the religious organization is another huge one um, that can be done. There should have some advocacy there. So a lot of country, a lot of communities have community development groups. Um, like say do on those kind of things. There should be some advocacy there as well. So, you know, there is a ready bed 
for that type of advocacy to take place. It just means that we need a system that really focuses on public health and is dedicated towards doing that so that this type of advocacy can take place. Um, and, and that takes us straight to, to capacity. Um, you know, having an adequate and well-trained public health workforce. Absolutely. Um, and that well-trained public health workforce, they have, to have, they have to have the good, the right numbers and the right capacities. Um, do we have so it? What is, what, <laughs> do we have it, Doc? <laughs> yeah. So what is needed for one community may not be what is needed for another community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I like to give that example of, um, of a, a human rights tragedy that occurred in, the, in, in Kenya, I think it was, or Ivory Coast. It was considered a human right, a human, tra human tragedy because the maternal mortality rate was the highest in the world. Mm -hmm. And mat maternal mortality rate is considered a vital statistic of your country. That means when someone comes in to look at your health system, one of the things they look at is your maternal mortality rate yes. and your infant mortality rate. If those two things are high, it means that your health system is really, really messed up. In a bad way, so yes. they went in. And, this, and the reason that was happening in that country is because many of the pregnant women chose to deliver the baby baby through bush doctors, not the well-trained capacity nurses. So, and they thought that because the facilities wasn't good enough, the people weren't coming, and the facilities didn't have enough capacity and enough resources and so on. In that example, they built the facilities, they gave them new resources, they trained the nurses, so they had the right number of nurses, they had the right capacity of nurses and the right skill mix to make sure that these nurses are going to deliver a good care. And after evaluating the, the outcome, it turns out that nothing changed. Mm. The mortality rate continued to increase. And so they realized the program had failed. In evaluating the failure, you know what they found? They found that although the nurses was in the right number and they were, had the right capacities, the nurse, the, the, the pregnant women felt that the nurses didn't like them and the way the nurses were tre mm. treating them, they felt really embarrassed and unwelcomed. Um, and so they decided not to go because of the attitude mm -hmm. the nurses gave to them. Training. Training. So that capacity that we're talking about, you have to know what the needs of a community is before you can actually mount the appropriate training. And so again, I want to hear out the data is around. We know who's dying from what. We know what sexes are dying from what. We just need to take that data and figure it among ourselves what type of training we're going to do, the type of numbers and capacities that we need to give the kind of right public health approach. Right. Now, when we, when we, so with capacity, um, and, and you mentioned that the data is wrong, the information is there, right? Um, so we need it to be, one, accurate, timely, and it must be able to support the health actions, um, such as, for example, relevant research, surveillance, and you mentioned earlier, monitoring and evaluation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when it comes to public health, timeliness is an important issue. Um, because if you wait too late, you can see what can happen. Um, COVID taught us that. Mm -hmm. So countries who acted early had a better health outcome. This is why we in the Caribbean, especially in the east, uh, in the in, sub, in the, in the sub, <clears throat> sub region, did so well because we acted early on things that the bigger countries took late to do. So it was timely in, in that public health response for COVID. It was also accurate. And it, <clears throat> the reason why our sub-region became accurate is because from the very early up, we as the technical people was following the data. We were following the data and, and tra tracking things from where it started as it you know, spread across the world. And so those timeliness and accurateness of the data was what was able to give us the best public health response. So absolutely correct. Yeah, and of course, all of that combined um, with good governance and, and the advocacy, getting the information out there, um, it can definitely bring you excellent results. Absolutely. Yes, it can. And we've seen it uh, work before our eyes. 
Yeah. I want us to go back a bit, huh? um, because I know we had tied in the whole issue of prevention um, and, 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 and going back here to the, 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 the co-service areas. We had tied in very well the issue of prevention into protection, because it is, in truth and in fact, um, a form of, of protection. And you did speak of, um, for example, vaccination, which is very important. What about the issue of screening? The issue of screening um, is extremely important, and it's important way early rather, rather than when we are screening now. Mm -hmm. um, and the focus for screening should really be for primary prevention, um, because for secondary prevention, you already have the disease. You're just trying to protect, yes. prevent mm -hmm. the complications of the disease. So the focus has to be on primary prevention. Um, that's absolutely important. We screen in our health system right now, we seem to screen a lot for secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. We don't really screen for primary prevention. Let me give you an example. The, uh, the amount of men in Grenada that have sickle cell trait, they don't know. They don't know. Because sickle cell trait is not, or at least wasn't, something that was being screened for very early. Mm -hmm. Even me, when I was in college, I discovered I had sickle cell trait by accident. No one screened me for it. <clears throat> so um, a, 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 a pregnant woman might find out that she has a sickle cell trait again. And the reason for screening for sickle cell is important because the chance of you um, getting married to and having a child with another woman with a trait increases the chance of the child having a, the, the disease itself mm -hmm. by about 50%. So that's an example. And so the most important thing for screening for sickle cell is actually to screen the babies Baby. <laughs> when they were born. Some years ago, a program like this was started here in Grenada. Thank God for that. I don't know if it is still continuing. But that will certainly increase the amount of data that we have about the, the how much sickle cell we have here. Um, <clears throat> I said sometime before that when we look at the life expectancy of men and women in Grenada, men die f quicker than their female counterpart. I also said on a program that you've had here before that the life expectancy of children, boys and girls, is the same up to five years. And after five years, then they, they, they separate. The ladies, the, 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 the girls do better than the boys. And it's a simple reason that screening did not happen for the boy five years old and over. But the girls got screening because of health behaviors and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of screening that is very important because you can catch things very early, but it's not usually done. A lot of the health fears that we have here on the island right now, when you look at the demographics of the people who go for that screening in the health fairs, about 80 to 90 percent of them are full-blown adults who already know that they have a disease. Mm -hmm. Very rare does someone get a new number that they did not know from those health screenings. And so I want to focus on, I want to emphasize more that we should focus on screening at an earlier age for those chronic diseases um, before you wait in your 20s and 30s to get tested for those things. Okay, wonderful. Doc, um, let's take a short break. When we come back, I want us to touch a little bit on the environmental aspect of things. Um, and then we will open our telephone lines and, you know, engage our listeners. So, folks, stay with us. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Are you looking for a reliable, affordable, and customer-friendly pharmacy? Look no further than Hills and Valley Pharmacy, the nation's leading healthcare products and services provider. We are committed to serving you at convenient locations. Find an extensive and affordable selection of prescription and over-the-counter drugs and medical supplies at Church Street, Hillsboro, Karakou, Jubilee Street, Grenville, St. Andrew, near the bus terminal, and Halifax and Grenville Street, St. George. Our committed team is always available to offer valuable assistance for managing your health and wellness. Discover the additional benefits of 
our wholesale distribution on Halifax Street and our medical center on Grenville Street, where we provide in-house physiotherapy, massage therapy, doctor consultations, and eye care services. Our commitment is to satisfy all your healthcare needs, including competitive prices, loyalty rewards, and special discounts for seniors. Contact us at 435-6904 and WhatsApp 535-4734. Choose Hills and Valley Pharmacy. Remember, your health is our business. I'm a VIP. I'm a VIP. I'm a I'm a VIP. Are you a VIP? Have you taken the necessary steps to safeguard your child's health? Let's get it right. Get your child on their vaccination schedule. Our national protection and coverage is our national priority. Our actions will impact Grenada's health and wellness. Let's make childhood immunization and vaccination number one. I am Senator Jonathan Lacret, and I am a VIP champion. Let's make all our children VIPs, vaccinated, immunized, and protected. Let's all be VIP champions. A message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Religious Affairs. Be a VIP childhood vaccination and immunization campaign in collaboration with UNICEF and the Pan American Health Organization. Have you heard about the new Softweed bathroom tissue with Total Hygiene? As hygiene and safety have taken center stage, our bathroom tissue is now manufactured with three different technologies to offer the best protection for you and your family. UVC light technology for a safe and effective disinfection process, eliminating 99.9% .9 of microorganisms. Also, production at high temperatures, killing all types of germs and bacteria. And it's pH controlled with delicate fibers to prevent irritation for even sensitive skin. Soft Weave Total Hygiene Bathroom Tissue. Available in supermarkets and shops island-wide. Visit Soft Weave Caribbean Facebook or Instagram pages for more information. Saturday, May 4th, there will be a shift on the island as the biggest grilling fest in Grenada moves to the Big Parish. The Maggie King of the Grill Competition is at Progress Park St. Andrew. Come taste the most sumptuous creations from the grill as top chefs and food enthusiasts showcase their culinary skills. Maggie King of the Grill is a festival like no other with live soca music, fun attractions, and games for the entire family. Then from 6 p.m., get a chance to win up to $5,000 cash and bingo. Interested vendors and grillers should call 456-3454 to register before March 31st. It's the Maggie King of the Grill competition at Progress Park St. Andrew. Gates open from 12 noon. Bring your appetite and stay tuned to this station for more details. Okay, welcome back, folks. It is uh, a doctor in call. We're talking with Dr. Francis Martin. We're looking at public health, very, very important area indeed. And um, I, I, I trust that um, you've been able to uh, pick up quite a bit from our the first part of our discussion. Um, you know, and of course we continue. Doc, I, I wanted to just go back a bit. Eh? Um, I was just reviewing my notes. And um, uh, there was one area, um, we, we probably just, you know, spoke briefly, but the issue of economic stability and, and, and how it, it, you know, correlates with public health. Let's talk a bit about that, because I was looking at a little um, a bit of information. Um, and for example, in the U.S., um, one in 10, um, one out of every 10 person lives in poverty. Uh, and that's according to, 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 to stats. Stability um, impacts um, public health in a very major way. I, I, I mean, when I was at college, I have a very good good friend, Dara, and I used to tell him, because I love physics, I used to say to him, physics explains everything on the face of the earth. He says, said to me, Francis, finance explains everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Money talks. 
<laughs> so I had the opportunity of doing a presentation at his church mm-hmm. and I publicly conceived. I said, Darren, you're right. At the end of the day, um, health is important, but finance plays everything. So economic stability is right at the heart of it. But not just economic stability, it must also be the understanding of the government of the day mm-hmm. about the appropriate resource that has to be put into health. Because not every country gives the amount of funds for from the GDP to help as would be. Right now, I think it, it might be subject to change, but the U.S. was the country that gives the most of the GDP to health. Um, in our region, it used to be Brazil. I don't know what it is now. Brazil used to give about 10% of the GDP to health, the health expenditure. And use of 15. For most of us in Eastern Caribbean, it's somewhere between six and seven, I don't think eight, but six and seven of our GDP um, for health expenditures. So your economic stability and the growth in your GDP should impact how um, what happens and uh, with your health. Um, the, 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 other, the worst thing about all of this economic um, stability is the issue of catastrophic financing. Mm-hmm. Catastrophic financing is a very un, un, unfortunate situation where you become sick, and as a result of becoming sick, you immediately become a poor, a poor person because all your savings it's is going to be taken yes. up. Mm-hmm. And the two things in the Caribbean here that that um, unleashes um, this kind of um, um, this kind of for um, the um, hardship from sickness is kidney failure and cancers. Those things are catastrophic financing because uh, on average you're not able to pay for those issues, so you immediately become a poor person. And so understanding economic. Um, Um, stability also means you as an individual and the community must also take on this economic stability issue personally as well to make sure that your finances are in place to um, give you the best cushion in the event that you become unwell. But you're you're right, economic stability is just as important because there are a lot of spin-offs of economic instability, Mm -hmm. which in in themselves become a public health hazard because um, the risk of, of, of murder increases, the risk of accidents increases, the risk of, of all kinds of things that are caused, social injustices, all of this could lead to public health impact as well. Yeah, and, um, you know, at, at, at its least, um, you know, the whole issue of economic stability, um, for example, being able to get adequate nutritious food, um, you know, is impacted by by um, your economic status. You know? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, I, although I think, I still think that in Grenada, we still have the opportunity to eat well. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not of the opinion that eating on uh, um, eating well is so expensive that we can't afford it. That eating on well, I, I do a whole public talk on this issue of general health and what we're eating. Um, but but the, but but long and short of it is, depending on who you are and where you are and where do you live, not being able to have enough funds to make sure you get your bright colored vegetables and eating your ground provision and so on, that can be a problem and that can impact your health because of that aspect of economic instability. Yes, indeed. Another area has to do with um, access to, to education. Um, when when education is not available, um, some decisions are are not in the best interest of the individual, um, and of course, economic status can also um, impact that. Yeah, it's, it's it's like a dog chasing its tail, um, because the lack of education decreases your earning ch- chances because it decreases your chance of getting a good job, and then the decrease of your chance of getting a good job in itself impacts your economic you ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so in public health, it's called the poverty trap, where you were in a poor situation, and because you were in a poor situation, you couldn't get the good energy. Um, education, and because of lack of education, no, you, you don't have a good job. I always remember there was a big fight in my house when I was a little boy, because my father believed that I should go to the garden, because in those days, that's all that the boys do. They go mm-hmm. to the garden and they become a farmer. And my mother wanted me to go to school. 
And so there was a little tussle between him and her, and eventually come to a situation where uh, she says, okay, let him go to school for four days of the week, and on Friday you could get him. <laughs> good again. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that, not, not, not a bad trade-off, at least. <laughs> so, I got to enjoy four days in school. And one day in the garden. garden. But I think eventually, I think they got, he got, he understood that maybe I was doing well in school, and eventually he considered that yes. I was able to go to school seven, um, five days of the week. But I remember that, that, that situation. If I wasn't doing very well in school, he would have said, you see, I tell you, let's bring the boy to the garden. So fortunately, I escaped that poverty trap. Um, and so I was able to improve my own economic stability. And as a result, um, my entire family is doing much better. Right. Lovely. Um, just continuing again, the issue of discrimination and violence. Um, and, and, and I just want to sticking accidents here i mean we had a rather unfortunate occurrence over the weekend where two uh men in the prime of their lives um one one um from what i understand the student at at um tam Sissy lost their lives in a biking accident you know yeah. um so so these are all factors that um and, and we mentioned earlier the issue of, of, of prevention and, and, and protection. And we heard, um, I think, the president of the association um, speaking heavily on the issue of, um, you know, having the proper helmets and all of these things that can protect you, you know? Yes. So they, they do have their, their impacts. Yes, they do. In fact, um, domestic violence, violence against women and accidents plus suicide as well mm -hmm. those are considered very serious public health issues because the accidents that are more likely to affect the accidents that are more likely to be a, a public health issue the riskier population is like the younger ones mm -hmm. because these are the ones that would tend to take riskier actions would drive faster have, um, break the rules more often um, except in the case of something like an oil spill or some natural, uh -huh. um, I don't want to say natural disasters because no, no disaster is natural. It's, it's this disaster happened because men have encroached on areas that they're not supposed to encroach mm -hmm. on. So, um, uh, so, so that kind of behavior affects everyone. But the suicides, the domestic violences, the accidents, um, these mostly affect the productive part of your population. And so not only is it having a public health impact, that impact is also going to have on your whole economy and mm -hmm. your whole social setup and social strata and everything. So like everything just link one into the other, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, you, you, usually um, nowadays, any chance I get, I I, I love to um, insert the whole issue of climate change. Climate change is the biggest conversation um, in the world today. And... Um, Public health, um, when you, you look at what is happening, climate change can seriously impact public health. Well, it has already seriously started to impact public health. Um, <clears throat> we have some evidence that suggests that the uh, rising temperature does have some cardiovascular and respiratory um, um, impact. We also are fully much aware that the changes in weather patterns, the flooding and volcanoes and everything like that also has very physical public health impact um, on, on, on everyone. So <clears throat> the information is already out there. Um, you know, the, the, the whole global warming issue, um, erosion of the coast, you know, the composition of your sea, the type of fish you'll be able to get from your sea, the kind of food you'll be able to grow because of the quality of your soil. All of that is impacting on public health in a very chain link, intertwined kind of way. Um, and so there is, uh, there are international institutions that are set up to help to deal with that aspect and to uh, help with the public health aspect of things uh, because of climate change. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, Doc, anything you want to add in before we go to our telephone lines? Well, not anything much, but just to reiterate this whole issue of public health um, and juxtapose that against disease management. I want to re-emphasize in the mind of people 
that disease management is not the same as health care. Health care is what we're discussing here tonight. Mm -hmm. We're discussing prevention, health promotion, protection. We're discussing those three P's of public health, prevention, protection, and, 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 and health promotion. That is different to disease management. People love disease management because it's easy to take a pill mm -hmm. to get your blood pressure to go down. It's easy to take a, blood, uh, a pill for your blood sugar to go down. But prevention requires people to take, to take action. Sure. It requires government to take actions. It requires the society and the communities to take action. And it requires them to do things that sometimes are not liked um, because pre people prefer to have the freedom. Um, and because of that, citizens and, and, and communities like that forces the government to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We force the governments to make sure that the hospital is working well. We force the government to make sure that there are drugs on the island. We force the government to make sure that there is medical investigative services available. But no one forces the government to implement preventative measures. Yes. And I want to reiterate that because to my mind, that is real meat of this whole issue of public health. So then why, why, what, what, what is the role of, for example, the private sector, NGOs, um, this two in particular? Can't well, they step in well, and... Well, Godfrey, the private sector is not interested in public health mm. because that's how they make their money. NGOs might be interested in, in public health, all right? Now, the more cars get into an accident, who makes money? Yeah. The more people die, who, who makes money? The, the more people are sick, who makes money? But but if we don't but the, um, as you mentioned earlier, um, it comes back to the the dog chasing its tail scenario, because if you have people who are sick, then they will not be able to earn money to support the private sector, and 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 and, and this, the, the spiral continues. So the there must be there must be. Something, Godfrey. In my last program, I told you that in 1978, the Alma Ata Declaration was signed in Alma Ata, Russia, which clearly stated that primary health care is the best health care system yes. for the rest of the world, especially for developing countries, that is. Even today, we still haven't achieved primary health care. And you know, the fundamental reason is the economic gains that are there uh, for people and for certain organizations that are actually investing in disease they're investing in disease i remember when i was studying in the u.s one morning the consultant came to us and said please buy shares in diabetes testing machines because the data was showing that the, the increase in diabetes is going to be so much that yeah. that machine is going to make a lot of money i couldn't understand it back then because i was a medical student but now i look back and i was like you see seriously I, 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 I want to pry here, Dr. Martin. I wonder if you bought shares. No, I did not buy shares. <laughs> For, folks, that was a fast one. I, I just pulled a fast one on Doc. Man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there is a, there is a serious role mm -hmm. to play in all of this. Now, some private, um, private sector... Um, have a stake in it. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the more sick leave your staff brings in, uh, the more the, 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 the lower your earning potential is. Especially yes. if your business has to do with selling something on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. less staff you have, mm -hmm. it impacts you. So you that private sector may have an impact, um, may have reasons for that impact. But there are some other private sector that has no stake in the matter whether someone comes to work or not, and so they might not be as interested in in in, in the public health approach as others. But it's a ticklish question. Um, but it's a question that must be spoken about and a mm -hmm. conversation that must happen because we need the sector. Yes, yes, we do. We do indeed. So, folks, um, our telephone line is open. The number is 435-2041. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask uh, Dr. Martin, you can do so now. The number again, 435 2041 so you can give us a call or, or you know to make your contribution let's go to the telephone i think we have our first caller on the line doctor and call good evening hello 
Good, good evening. morning. Yes, good evening, caller. Good night. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, um, we seem to have lost the caller. Apparently, there may have been some little issues. So, folks, um, let me just remind you that um, when you call, uh, once the, the call is taken, kindly turn the volume of your radio or television down and listen to us on your telephone. All right? So, let's go back to the telephone. And Dr. Call, good evening. Yes, sir. Good evening to you. How are you doing? Quiet, you know, and good evening to the doc. Wonderful program. You know, I um, I like how you squeeze in income there. You're, you're, you're a brilliant guy, you know. Trust me. I like how you're squeezing the income there because the conversation to me is income. With all docs says, it's income. And that's the reason why you will always find me pounding the growth and development of the economy, we putting people to work so you can give them a good salary, therefore being able to eat the right food. I am following a trend, and the trend is a cancer trend, for quite a number of years, and I'm asking questions, and I, I can't get answers, because I have a lot of young people coming down with cancer. Well, how do young people come down with cancer? When do it start? Yes, it started a long time ago when you was not eating the right food, and now the cancer grew, and it caught you at that age, so you have to go, you know? And so we have to be very, very careful that it raises to people income to allow them a chance to get the right food because the food we need to prevent cancer, the food we need to eat to prevent cancer, is not cheap. It's very expensive today. Who have the money to purchase this food? And that's the problem. Now, um, I, I want to ask, I asked Dr. Question a few years ago, maybe about two years ago, and I'm yet to get an answer because I have made a discovery and um, until I get an answer, I cannot disclose um, my discovery. Do LPG cause cancer? I asked Dr. Gratani and he says he, he was going to do some research on that. I would want to know because I make an observation, but before I give the observation, I think I'll come back to doctor when I when I when I get the answer and to tell him exactly what it is. But I think is a very serious issue and that is helping the cancer growth in people, and we need to stop that practice as quickly as we should. No, doc, we have a problem in the hospital, and I think you can help. The eye clinic has a laser machine that is not working for a bit of a few years, but it is believed that it can be repaired because it's decalibrated and need to be recalibrated. Um, could you help in, in securing either the repair of the machine or the purchase of a new machine? I am an old patient of the eye clinic. It's not easy for me. And it's not easy for a lot of people who are worse than me. We are languishing, and it is tough for the doctors. Only they do a good job, but it is tough on them because the backlog is preventing me from getting my cataract surgery. I wish you can help, Doc. Okay. You, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you, caller. Thank you very much indeed. All right. Um, Doc, I don't know if you catched everything that um, the caller said, but let me let me just sort of go through it. So first, he um, sort of reemphasized the importance of the the of income um, when we spoke of economic stability, um, because he feels that without that, um, people are unable to get the foods that they need to remain healthy. Um, with with um, making reference to to cancer as well. So that was the first thing that he he emphasized. Um, the second one, um, he said he had asked you that question some years ago, and you were supposed to do some research. And the question is whether or not LPG, um, and that's a gas, um, causes cancer. Um, okay. Okay, okay. 
um, <clears throat> LPG. That's that's supposed to be liquid liquefied petroleum. Yeah, yeah, propane and so. Yeah, um, that that we use in our 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 stove um, for cooking and so. All right, 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 mm -hmm. right. No, the, the the LPG is is the danger is with aerosolization of the molecules, or the molecules get very small and you can actually inhale them. One thing for sure is that it could cause something that we call interstitial pneumonitis. That means the cells on the lining of the lungs just gets very inflamed by inhaling such a um, uh, toxic substance. And anytime, anytime there is prolonged inflammation in any part of the human body, there is always a chance that, uh, that cancer can, um, can happen as a result of prolonged um, uh, prolonged exposure to any gases of that nature. So um, gases like chlor chlorine and, and any time you get exposed to it for a very long period of the time, this constant inflammation can actually cause some changes in the lungs. But to say that there is a direct correlation, I'm not seen, I have not seen anything that shows that there's a direct correlation between LPG and cancers. Um, I would need a lot more data um, to be able to determine that. All right. Um, I, I recall reading um, a, a study that was done by the uh, by Stanford University as it relates to that sometime last year. And there was some reference to it. But um, like everything else, um, one study is just one study. Um, we know in science that it takes a number of studies, you know, to actually, um, you know, come up with these, um, you know, conclusions. So, um you know, I, I guess, you know, folks can, can do some... I'm looking at something that was done in 1983 um, for... It was a study done among women in Hong Kong um, that made some reference to um, overexposure of the uh, smoke from burning of these uh, gases Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that has some aspects that can affect the lung to a certain extent. Um but again, it didn't give a cause and effect relationship. Um, it, it, it they kind of made like a likeliness to secondhand smoking kind of thing um, when you get exposure to mm -hmm. smoke for a long period of time. But certainly, it's something that has gained my interest um, and look forward to looking at it a little bit more. You know? Yeah. Um. It, it's it, there, there's quite a bit of um. Apparently, there's a lot of information regarding that. Um. And you know, people can go and you know, and and from what I've seen, some of the sources are quite credible. Um. Because you actually get the reference to the studies uh, from some of the universities. So um. You know, people can do some some reading on them, and um. I'm sure they can get some information, um. On on that, but um. You know, I I am in no position to say yea or nay on it. <laughs> you know, yes, it's true. Yes. Um, because even the studies that I'm seeing and looking at, uh, they're still conflicting reports. That's um, right. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I I think th th this is the further that I can go now that there are conflicting reports. So we just need to keep following the data and see where it and takes us. Yeah. All right. Let's go back to the telephone. We may have another caller. Doctor and call. Good evening. Good Hello. Evening. Yes, good evening, caller. Yes, good evening, Doc. Good evening. Doc, are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Go ahead. All right. Doc, do you believe that generally we are addicted to food? That's one. And then, do you think that we are doing enough to promote health, healthy eating and so forth? Overall, because I say that to, to the effect that somebody say, well, the food that would prevent cancer is very expensive. I, I know where that's coming from, because I find the things that come in, in the, the processed farm and so forth, they are more expensive than if you eat what we call grown-up local food like your blogger and your fig and your yam and 
so many herbs and caralou and things people live long from eating the food. You can survive with food too. I personally don't see them food being expensive if you're eating what you're supposed to. So I believe, I could be wrong, that education needs to be focused on one, the amount of food people eat, and to the type of food people eat. I mean, I went on the jetty on Friday and Thursday, and on a weekly basis, those things I see offloading from the boats and being consumed, and then the cans and the plastics are being put into our environment. They are of a more public concern to me than the dollars and cents. That's my two pence for the time being. Thank you very much, caller. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Doc, were you able to pick it up? So, uh, yeah. Me, very much over here. Yeah. Two things. He, one, he asked um, whether you believe that um, as, as a people we are addicted to food. And um, secondly, um, whether we are doing enough to promote um, healthy eating. Um, and he also said that he believes that the, we should focus heavily on, one, the amount of food that we eat and the type of foods that we eat. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously that guy is, is um, he has had some interaction with health before. And so mm -hmm. um, to the first question, people might be surprised to hear what I'm going to say. But interestingly, the answer is yes. For many, many years, the data has been clearly showing that there is one commodity in this world that is considered to be an addictive substance. Yes, everybody talk about cooking. Yes, everybody talk about alcohol. But people don't usually talk about high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. High fructose corn syrup is produced as a commodity in the United States. And high fructose corn syrup has found its way in almost 90-something percent of all processed foods. The data and the science over the years have shown that when you expose yourself to high fructose corn syrup, it causes addiction. By decreasing the amount of leptin in your brain, that, part, that hormone in your brain tells you you, you you had enough food, stop eating. High fructose corn syrup decreases that level of leptin in your brain. And eventually, as you expose yourself to this over time, you become addicted. But the addiction is not for healthy foods because these high fructose corn syrup is not really found in healthy foods, healthy local foods. So the answer is yes, you can be addicted to food, but the addiction is mostly to processed imported foods. Whether we are doing enough, there's always room for improvement. I agree there's always room for improvement, but I've lived in this world for many, many years. I've been practicing medicine for more than 20 years now, and I can clearly tell you that the goalpost has shifted. When we started, when I started practicing medicine 20 something years ago to where we are now, a lot more is being done now to promote healthy eating than ever yes, used to be done yes, before. Yes. Yes. So let's not put our mouths, you know, we, we're not blowing our trumpet, but let's just be real and honest about this thing. When my children can lecture me on healthy eating, then you know something is going on. Yes. When, when, when kids can tell you things about green light and red light food, and okay, you know that something is happening. You know, just like with men's health, the, 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 the um, goalpost has moved with men's health. Men's are coming out more and getting their prostate checked, getting their testosterone checked and so on. So to answer your question, yes, there is more that could be done, but we are doing a lot more than we ever was doing when it comes to healthy eating. And just to confirm, the foods under the ground is the best foods to eat. It, it raises your blood sugar very slowly. The foods just above the ground, which is the cabbages, carrots, lettuces, and so on, those are the next best to eat. It doesn't shift your uh, blood glucose that much at all. But those at your height, which is your fig tree and your blogger tree, those are absolutely good food because it does not interfere with your blood sugar in any way at all. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. And Doc, I just wanted to, uh, uh, before we go to the, the other part, I just wanted to share something. Now, it's, it's a site I usually use a lot for, for my program, um, WebMD. Very, very credible. Um, and, and, and it made reference to the issue of the um, food addiction. Uh, it says, like addictive drugs, highly palatable foods trigger feel-good brain chemicals, including dopamine. And um, we, we know what dopamine does, um, you know, well, same feel-good, uh, you get that, that excellent feeling. Once you experience pleasure associated with increased dopamine transmission in your brain's reward pathway from eating certain foods, you may quickly feel the need to eat again. Absolutely. When, when I do that lecture on um, healthy eating, general healthy eating, I go into more details and speak more about this dopamine. And that's the reason why they call drugs dope. Yeah. Yep. Because it gives you that feel-good attitude. Yep. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Let's go back to the telephone. I think we have another caller on the line, or did we did we lose? Yeah, I think we lost that. Um, we lost that. that well, let's go back. Let's try again. See where we are. The doctor and call. Good evening. Hey, good evening, Citizen Augustine. Can the doctor hear me? Yeah, yes, he is. If he, if he doesn't, I will just wait, relate. Wait, so well, Lord, I'll cut it short. Yeah. I just want to congratulate him, as usual, on an excellent job this evening. He says it as it is. He says it correctly. He says it with meaning, conviction. You know what I like about him when he refers to quote-unquote blogger and fig? I want to tell you, Doc, I, five times a week I guarantee that I eat my blogger and fig. Just as it is, they are going behind my house. Thank you <laughs> for advising us. The thing is, how many people listen? This is the problem. And of course, as it relates to the cost and otherwise, yes, sometimes we do find some unscrupulous ground provision dealers that increase prices and so on. But I think if even we make the effort and we concentrate on that line, we can't lose. Absolutely not. But I have a, pre pre a question. You see, Doctor, the issue related to cancers in Grenada, it seems to me that, well, God forbid, but is there a particular place in Grenada, if we care, a parish or any known geographical name place that has a leading output of cancer cases? I trust my question is understood. In other words, is village A or village B or parish A or parish B leading in cancer? I ask this question because of certain information I've been gathering recently and I wouldn't say what it's all about now, but it has to do with weaponry. I leave that part. I hope my question has been understood, Doctor. Take care of yourself. All for now, the system's functioning fairly all right. But whenever any of them fail, I'll be a senior. Take care of yourself and stay safe. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, of course, Doc um, uh, Citizen, congratulating you on, on, of course, the information provided, and um, you know, and he was asking in the end, um, like, if there's any any data to show if there's any particular area, village, community in Greater that um, is leading in terms of the cancer cancer cases. Um, do we have that kind of data? I mean, are we aware? Do we know? Yeah. That, that's it's not the first time I was asked this question, and on retrospection, I'm sorry I didn't um, get that data. Not that I want to publish it, because, of course, you know what's going to happen if you publish the thing, but information like that could be used to educate and give program, not necessarily broadcast that, you know, there's cancers in, 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 in um, Grand Roy, for example. Um, so, no, I don't have that data ag aggregated as I as I should have. I only have the, the data on cancers generally in the country. But I want to tell you something, though. When I just started to practice medicine about 2001, 2002, I had an interesting um, interaction with a, a, a consultant who's not here in Grenada anymore. But at that time, it was very clear. There was a lot of people with what turned out to be cancers of the um, of the liver 
and other major organs. But what was interesting about that, it was that these people were living in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. Like they were living in places like Monlong, Butch Grove, Clojier, mm -hmm. Florida. Now, what was common farming in those in those areas? What is common about those areas? That's farming, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they they were banana farmers, right? And they used to use a lot of pesticides. So there was an int. We made me and the consultant made an interesting observation, not cause and effect, as I said, but we was found it interesting that people in that area of the of the um of the country had those liver diseases and liver cancers. Mm -hmm. And we put it down to probably overexposure of pesticides. We made uh, about halfway into my career, there was another um, interaction I had with another consultant who is not a government employed um, consultant. And it turns out that an interesting number of females died from some female cancers. What was also interesting about them is that many of them worked in the nutmeg pool. Oh. Right? And it was particularly the nutmeg pool that exported nutmeg. So it had to do something with exposure of the, some kind of exposures that they got. And uh, I, I, I mean, I, we, could, we, they could, we could tweak the answers a little bit, but I think it came down to the part that I think the paint that they were using to paint the bags yeah. may have been responsible for that illness. That kind of, so. Yeah. The, the answer is yes, there is the kind of data out there. We just need to go collect it and see what has happened. But it will be an interesting um, study if ever, ever, ever anybody takes it on. Yes, yes, indeed. Very, very, very interesting. And some of what you're saying, Doc, um, it, it points us back to some of the, the our earlier discussion. You know, um, let's go Let's go to the telephone and take another call. Doc, Dr. Call. good evening. Good evening. Yes, sir. Mm. Yes. Um, I, uh, there are two things. One are the climate and, and, and medical matter. Uh, the climate one, um, I notice that the scientist is not telling us the people who are living closest to the equator that we are the ones that are going to die first from climate change. You're not telling us nothing about that. The second uh, question is, uh, I want to know if there is some connection between emotional health and mental health thank you very much okay thank you thank you caller um all right so so his first point um He's saying that the scientists apparently is not telling us that uh, those of us who live closer to the equator will die first um i i don't know much about that i mean <clears throat> I, I don't know much about that either, but um, our genetic makeup um, makes us able to live in a harder part of the country, that of the world, than other parts of the world. No, and definitely. of course, being black and melanin on our skin, um, I'm just hoping that you know we're going to get enough time to reclimatize to the new things. But I have no evidence that those living in the equator is going to die first. Um, sometimes people have ways of getting information that I don't understand. So if that person... Um, has some information um, that people living close to the equator is going to die first. I would really like that person to contact me. My number is 0050311. So you and I can have a one and one because I'm really interested in that bit of information if that turns out to be true. Um, because there's some other aspects of climate change um, that, that, that we need to discuss. The second part of the question is whether or not emotional health has to do with mental health. Uh -huh. Again, I have a, 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 a real one hour public lecture on that issue? The answer is yes. Yes. Um, and that is because there is a part of our emotional brain. This is the middle part of our brain is the emotional part of our brain. That is the part that is responsible for memory and making feel good and that kind of thing. It undergoes something called neuroplasticity. That means that part of your brain can change depending on the toxic environment in which you live. In other words, a child can grow up to become a very angry person if that child is exposed to toxic environments. Same thing with toxic relationships. Toxic relationships can cause relationships to really go bad, which means that the opposite is also true. That if you provide a nurturing, loving, kind environment 
then those new brain pathways that you're going to make because of neuroplasticity will make you into a more mentally and healthier person. So the answer is yes. And now that I'm giving that caller that answer, I hope that caller is going to make good environmental decisions <laughs> so that they're good, lovely <laughs> neuroplasticity within himself and his family. <laughs> right, right. Yes, it is. I, I just want to just go back on the the the, 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 the comment he made regarding climate change. Um, Doc, I, I have done um, a significant amount of work in that in that area. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, the caller has to look around. Um there are so many factors um, as it relates to climate change. One of them being migration. Um, I mean, look what is happening in some of the the the, the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, look where some of the the worst floods are taking place. Um, some of the more terrible rainfalls are taking place, um, and and you can see for yourself. Um, you know where people are dying first so i uh, i don't think it's correct to say that um people close to the equator um will die first at all um you look around and you pay attention to the evidence and um you'd realize that climate change in fact um the whole issue of global warming the 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 the, 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 the north or the arctic regions they're warming faster and and you know than than the equator so um look around call and and you would you would get a lot of information regarding that Doc, um, we're almost out of time, so um, let me give you a minute just to make any closing comments that you... Well, I, I believe I believe um, repetition is the key to learning. Indeed. Repetition is the key to learning. So I'm going to repeat what I said before. Um, citizens of this country and colleagues, the fastest growing business in St. George's right now are pharmacies. That's the fastest growing business. Indeed. Um, and it's pharmacies. Now, guys, seriously, sit down and think about this. If the fastest growing business is pharmacies and none of them closing down, all of them making money, what is that saying to you? The conversation on disease management and healthcare, that conversation has to be had. People must stop thinking of health in, in light of disease and tablets. We have to. Um, because in this scenario, is only one person that benefits. Well, no, not just one person that benefits. In this scenario, with disease management, only one person loses. Everybody else gains. One person that loses in disease management is you. Everybody else around you gain. Like if you die, your family gonna get your house and your land and so on if you die. Hmm. Then the doctor will get your money for the consultation fee. Then the pharmacist will get your money for the blood medication. The lab will get your money for the investigations. Everybody's taken from you, simply because of how you view health as disease management. Everybody's looking towards you. People going into certain professions in, doc in medicine, they go into certain um, professions simply by looking at what you're dying from, and then they decide what they're going into. People are making business on your head. That's the reality of what we're dealing with in this, with this health system. So colleagues, let's focus on healthcare rather than disease management. How do you stop you from taking a tablet? How do we stop you and keep you from uh, getting sick and not requiring a tablet? As I've said to some patients in the past, and you may, I may have said it on your form, forum as well, when I write a prescription, I feel that I have now handed over your healthcare to a pharmaceutical company. That's what I'm doing when I'm giving you a prescription. The day when you could come and sit and do your test and you leave the office without a prescription, I find that is a wonderful, glorious day. And everybody should rejoice because you left the office without a prescription. So that is all I want to say for tonight. I know we're gonna have opportunities for interactions again in the future yes, as long indeed. as the Lord gives me life and strength. And I look forward to the future um, um, interactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. It's always such a pleasure having you on the program. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to having you really, really soon again. So thank you so very much. Folks, we thank you for staying with us. Um, it was indeed a very interesting discussion. I trust that um, at least one thing you can take away from our discussion there. And you heard it from Dr. Martin there. Um, you know, you, 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 the 
one that's losing. Everybody else is gaining. So let's pay attention to that and, um, you know, do all we can to ensure that we protect, we promote, and we prevent. That way, we're on the right path to public health. And that would, of course, prevent us from, you know, or, or, or significantly reduce our chances of getting to the point of clinical medicine. So thank you very much. Do have a good night. Um, you can join us again tomorrow. I'll be back from 6 o'clock. Until then, do take care. All the best. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.